Let me first of all tell you a little bit about Everest. It's the highest mountain in the world. It's 8,848 meters high. It was first climbed to the top by Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay back in 1953. And since then, just over 5,000 people have climbed Everest, but only 10% have been women. The, uh, there are two main routes on Everest, one from the south through Nepal, the other from the north through Tibet or China. And these routes have ropes fixed all the way to the summit, which really helps with safety. You can clip into the ropes and it stops you falling off. Um, and it takes two months to climb Everest. It takes a long time because your body has to adapt to the altitude. Now, I didn't always want to climb Everest. I love mountains, but when I was younger, Everest seemed big and scary. But as I got closer to it, as I did more things, you know, walked higher, climbed higher, learned to climb, uh, it suddenly started feeling a little bit closer, possible. And it was in 2013 when I was invited to be, help organize the celebrations for the 60th anniversary of the first ascent of Mount Everest, for which I met the Queen. And I learned a lot about Everest then, and I became fascinated with it when I realized the main reason the British got to the top in 1953, but they hadn't in the 20s and the 30s, was because of the scientific understanding and the technology available to them. And we don't often talk about that. We always talk about the strength of the human spirit. We don't talk about the science that supports us. And I think we need to talk about both. So I began to realize that with a bit more experience, I probably could climb Mount Everest. And as a scientist, I could look into the things that make Everest safer and think about how I could give myself the best chance. Because it is risky. About one or two people in a hundred who try to climb Everest die trying. But it's not just like Russian roulette. We do have some control over the risks. Not all of them, but some of them. So I had a look at the statistics, because the statistics can inform our preparation. And you find that the death rate has been reducing over time. There's a big blip here. This is 1996. Have any of you seen the film Everest? It's a big disaster film. That's then. But in general, it's reducing. The death rate is reducing. And also, women and men have an equal chance of getting to the top. So being female isn't a disadvantage at all. In fact, it can have some advantages. And also, if you look at the statistics, you can find out where are the most dangerous parts of the mountain. And this is important because you can learn from other people's mistakes. So that's some of the preparation that I did. And we've got some videos on YouTube if you want to have a look and find out more about this. But let's, let's go to the mountain now. So a little journey to Everest. First of all, you have to walk to base camp. It's quite a long way. It's about as far as from here to Oxford and back. And there are no roads into the mountains, so you have to walk. So all the way from Lukla, all the way up, 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 to Everest Base Camp, and then finally to the summit of Mount Everest. And to give you an idea of how far away it is, this is uh, a, a view, my first view of Everest. It's uh, on day two of the walk-in. You can't see anything here. But if I zoom in a little bit through the clouds, about there, that's Everest. It's really far away. It took us 10 days to walk into base camp, but some of that was just because we had to let our bodies adjust to the altitude. And you get to see the scenery is getting more and more spectacular as we go up. Now, the reason we have to let our bodies adjust is that if you were taken from sea level and dropped at the top of Everest, you'd be unconscious in a matter of minutes. The body cannot survive up at that altitude because there's not enough oxygen up there. The atmosphere of Earth is kind of bleeding out into space. So the molecules up there take up a lot more space, which means that when you take a big lungful of air, there are actually fewer molecules in that lungful of air. That means your body's getting less oxygen. That's why it's dangerous. So we went off to base camp. It took us 10 days to get to base camp because your body has to slowly make adjustments so that it can survive. Base camp is just like a, a big town of tents that appears for about two months every year. And uh, it's, about, it's big. It can take about 45 minutes or an hour to walk across base camp, so it's huge. And it's actually on a glacier, so we're camped on rock and ice. This is where I lived for more than a month. 
And then we start doing these things called rotations. You basically go up and down the mountain. You can't just climb, this is a map. Base camp is here, camp one, camp two, camp three, camp four. Camp four is in the death zone, it's called, uh, because that's where you absolutely can't survive. If you stay there for more than a few days, that's it, you won't come down. Um, so, but you can't just climb camp one, wait there a few weeks or a week while you're acclimatized, camp two, wait while you're acclimatized, because your body would get weaker and weaker because of the lack of oxygen. So you have to go up to camp one to get exposure to the altitude, then come down to base camp to get stronger again, then go back up to camp two, get exposure, then go down to base camp again. So it's a bit demoralizing. <laughs> You're not really getting anywhere and it's hard. So these are the rotations. You first of all have to go through the ice fall. This is one of the most dangerous parts of the mountain. It's the, where the glacier, the river of ice, goes off a cliff and it breaks and cracks. And so you have ice blocks that are bigger than houses. You have crevasses that are so deep you can barely see the bottom. And uh, it's like a big icy obstacle course that you have to cross. And it's a bit dangerous as well because avalanches happen. This here is an, an avalanche you can see. So stuff can fall off the sides of these mountains and, uh, and that can land on you. And you don't want to be in the ice fall if that happens. So you have to get through the ice fall as quickly as possible. But it's big. It takes about six to nine hours to go through the ice fall. Uh, yeah, this is some ice blocks, icy obstacle course. And you have to cross some ladders like this, balancing to cross crevasses. Um, it's a little bit scary, you don't want to look down. And you've got spikes on your feet as well, crampons. This is a video of me going across the ladders. A little bit. Uh, that's a short one. There are there are longer ones as well, but I didn't really film so many of those. So um, then you go up into this place called the Western Coombe. It's a great big valley. So this is the first time you see Everest, and it's so impressive up there. This is why I wanted to climb Everest to see these kind of places, and you don't get the impression from pictures and videos that it's like when you're there, it's just huge. Everything is so big and so steep. You have these big walls of rock and ice going up to the side of you. And this is the first time you see Everest properly. It's this great hulking black rock here. And yeah, it looks very, it looks close, but still far away, if you know what I mean. It's, it's big and steep, but it's a long way to the top. And then when you go out between camp one and camp two, you have to cross this big ice cliff. This is taller than a house. And you can see there's two, two ladders strapped together here and then the ladders run out and you just have to go up through the snow and the ice. Uh, so this is quite hard because at this point you're at 6,000 meters. That's higher than Mount Kilimanjaro. So you can't breathe very well, it's quite difficult. And then it's a long, hot walk across the Western Coombe. People don't realize that Everest is actually really hot during the day, it's really cold during the night. But during the day it's like a solar concentrator, everything's reflecting and so you get very, very hot. And then you get to camp two, which is at the side of the glacier, in the rock and the ice. This is just a small part of it. Again, camp two stretches quite a long way. This is looking back down the other way. We've got quite big tents here, because camp two is also called advanced base. So they have a, a cook at, a, at advanced base. So you don't have to cook your own food. In the other places, at the tents, you have to boil water and you know, eat whatever you can carry up. Okay, so uh, then from camp two, you have to go up this. This is the Lotsi face. It's a big, steep, uh, steep face. You go up here and over to the left to the, what's called the South Col. And we went there after, on one of our rotations, we went to the bottom of the Lotsi face and up to about here, just, to, just for fun, really, or for acclimatization. And that was, um, after that, that was probably the the hardest part of the climb for me, it was quite demoralizing doing these rotations because it was hard and it hurt and you're not getting any closer to the top, you keep on having to go back down again. And I really wanted to get to camp three 
so that I didn't have to go up again and do another one. But we couldn't go to Camp 3 that day. We were told we had to go back down to base camp. And so there was a prospect of having to do the whole thing again. And, uh, and that to me was really, really hard, really demoralizing. But I had to just yeah, focus, pull yourself together. It's, it's a long time on the mountain. You just have to like, hang on in there and, and keep on going. I do have a little video, but I don't think we've got any sound. So I might just have to skip over the video. Is there sound? <laughs> Got some sound? Hopefully. Okay. So this is me in the tent at Camp 2, feeling, giving myself a bit of a pep talk, actually. Can you hear anything? Oh, no. I lied. <laughs> oh, no, it is, no, it is coming out. Oh, it's too quiet. Can you turn Sorry. up the volume on here? 